Well, good morning. It's Richard Pierce from Finextra TV, and I'm delighted today to be joined by John Flint. Uh, John is the chief executive of the UK Infrastructure Bank and was formerly the group CEO of HSBC. Good morning, John. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. We're doing a bit of a theme on UK infrastructure, and we're looking at the um, the, the impact of climate and nature on UK, UK infrastructure and what the plans are to actually mitigate and adapt against that. And I think this is where you come in, but tell us, a lot of people may not know a lot about the bank. Tell us what's your mission, mission and purpose. Yeah, the UK Infrastructure Bank is probably the newest piece of the financial architecture here in the UK. We were just under two years old. We were opened in June 21 by the then Chancellor, now Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. And we've been set up to ensure that the financing that is needed to get the infrastructure in place for the transition, the carbon transition, or for levelling up, to make sure that infrastructure gets gets built um, and, and, and gets and gets financed. So, so we've got a very narrow and very clear mission and purpose: UK focused infrastructure, net zero, and or levelling up and five priority sectors of clean energy, digital, waste, water and transport. Infrastructure projects, infrastructure assets, infrastructure networks, infrastructure technology and also the supply chains to support infrastructure. It's a very clear, very focused and quite a compelling mission for an organisation that's still hiring people. Well, that's fantastic to hear. We, we've just recently been having a few interviews with people that are saying, you know, the, the government's been good at setting targets, but not putting the, uh, the operational framework in place to actually deliver that. So it's good to hear. Um, you know, to drill down a bit further, if you will, from sort of those targets and those priority areas into why a bank is needed now and what your remit is versus perhaps the existing banking infrastructure. Yeah, it's a really important question because the the scale of financing required to get us to net zero, there are a range of estimates, but the smallest estimate for the UK over the next 20 years is £650 billion pounds of new investment or incremental investment. Um, the top end of the, the range of estimates is £1.4 trillion. Pounds. So vast amounts of money. The private sector in its current form is not currently set up really to meet all of those gaps it's unlikely that it will be able to provide all of those gaps and and therefore i think that the treasury have been wise in saying look that the transition here and the pace of the transition means that we might need some new interventions clearly we're going to need good policy we're going to need good revenue support mechanisms um, for new industries etc and the government i think has got a very strong track record in that regard but they've said OK, there could well be frictions and gaps in the markets that emerge here where a new infrastructure focused policy bank could be very helpful. And, you know, to be to be clear to, you know, my private sector colleagues were not set up to compete with them in any way. If they want to do a piece of business, that's great news for us. We wish them well and move on to the next room. We're set up to solve problems, to find gaps. Um, because we're different. We will have a different risk appetite. We are not constrained by regulatory capital frameworks. We manage to an economic risk framework. So we should be able to be helpful where the markets have run out of capacity or just don't have the risk appetite to do the things that clearly need to get done. You know, we know we, most people involved in this space will have a vision for what we need to build over the next 20 or 30 years. Having a vision is one thing having the courage to be there at the start to say okay let's commit capital now it's a very different thing yeah and that seems to be something we hear a lot of you know the banks have these sort of big numbers to make something bankable you know a billion or whatever a lot of the projects particularly on the natural capital side might be a few million and even some of the new uh, nascent technologies perhaps are considered to be very high risk, um, you know, particularly when you're considering forward looking data. So what do you do? What is the way that you take uh, your risk appetite and calculate it and deploy it? Yeah, well, our risk appetite is is demonstrably different to the market by design. You know, the Treasury set us up to be additional, so we can't deploy public money where it's not needed. So we have to satisfy ourselves that there is a need and that we will be 
changing the shape of market or, or, or a project through our intervention. We have a public return on equity target of two and a half to four percent when we get to steady state, which is very low. You know, for a public sector organisation that will have a very efficient cost base that has a very cheap cost of capital and cheap cheap um, cost of debt finance. Um, that's a very low target return on equity. And the signal that we want the market to take from that return target is that our risk appetite is different. We will do things that the other market won't have because our stakeholders are different. And it, when I talk about this, it, it's easy for people to conclude that I'm being critical of the private sector because our risk appetite is different to theirs. That's not my intention at all. We're all being entirely rational within the constraints that we, we operate within. You know, if you're accountable to a shareholder base that really is asking you for a 10% ROE, then that's what you need to organise yourself around. I have one shareholder, HMT, and um, His Majesty's Treasury wants two and a half to four percent return on equity. So that means that as we build our portfolio, we can afford to take different risks to to the market. Now that might just mean that we are more willing to put capital at risk in first of a kind technologies. Mm. It might mean that we're more willing to take policy risk, you know, to be confident that a government policy is going to sustain or is going to emerge in a particular way than the market might. There's lots of different ways that we can express that difference in risk appetite. But ultimately, the real litmus test for an organisation like this is if if infrastructure needed for either levelling up or for net zero is not happening, and it's not happening because the finance isn't available, then that's our problem. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that leads on to the additionality piece, which seems to be sort of quite a central tenet to what you're doing, I think. Um, uh, so I, I noticed that you you did your first uh, transaction around natural capital in Scotland, which was exciting to see. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit more about that, if if you will, and, and also comment on those observations you made around, you know, the need for data there. Sure. No, it, it it is a really interest interesting transaction, and the 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 journey by which we got there is interesting too. So I'll, no, I'll take you yeah. take you right back to the beginning of this. So when the bank was set up, two objectives: net zero and and leveling up. Um, and shortly after we were established, um, a bill start a bill was um, um, written to progress through Parliament to put the bank on a legislative footing. As the bank was progressing through the House of, as the bill was progressing through the House of Lords, um, there was a lot of debate about whether or not we should be given a third objective to support na the natural capital markets, mm. or whether natural capital needed to be included in the definition of infrastructure. And obviously, the the, the bill process happens away from us, but we observe it going through. And as an executive committee, we were kind of intrigued by by the Lord's interest in this. And we quickly figured out that irrespective of what happened to the bill, it was a really good question. We needed we needed to figure out as an executive team, you know, how we thought about natural capital and what role we thought we should play. Mm. So we did some work on that. Um, you know, one of the benefits of, of being a public sector body is we get to recruit all these brilliant civil servants who come and, and help us and have helped us build a bank. Um, a number of them worked on a position paper on natural capital, which was our attempt to kind of define what's the state of the land in the UK, how does it, or the landscape for natural capital markets in the UK, and what might our role be. It was a really good piece of work, but at the end of it, we all felt a little bit underwhelmed with um, the potential for us to be involved because it kind of said, well, the markets are still in a very nascent stage. There's not a great deal of private capital moving into the, into the capital markets. The projects are all small. You know, we've got um, we've got the carbon credit markets in different stages. We've got biodiversity net gain coming down the line quite quickly, but the markets were in a pretty nascent stage. We had that conversation with our board, and we had a really great conversation with the board. And they they challenged us to say, "Well, try and do something a bit different. Then you know, try yeah. and try and find something where you can make a difference." So we we were introduced to this project in in Scotland, run by Dr. Jeremy Leggett, um, which 
provided us with the opportunity to do something that that, that other banks wouldn't do. So we provided a short term bridging facility to Highlands Rewilding to allow them to complete their um, some more fundraising that they want to do, and that allowed them to complete the acquisition of a third estate. So they already own two estates in Scotland, but they have they are in the process of completing the um, the acquisition of uh, an estate called Tavy um mm. on the west coast. And I was up there last week, um, and it's a really beautiful part of the world. And the 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 plans for the estate, I think, are really exciting. Fantastic. And well, we we've done a lot of work with tokenization and rewilding through our workshop. So we love this whole this whole area. Right. Um, and one of the things, I mean, you've got to prove this additionality in advance, as I read it, and you've also got to um, you know, evidence, you know, impact, if you will. Um, when you look at a project like that, I mean, obviously you can please reference other other areas of your work, but then quite often, and where our uh, audience is quite interested is how do you get the data, you know, from the ground um, and, and bring that back to obviously both the risk process as well as, you know, the impact evidence? Yeah. So data to support your impact narrative for everything we do generally is clearly important. And for a lot of what we do, it's it's more well established. If you if you invest in a port, finding the number of jobs that you're going to create and support, the amount of concrete that you're going to end up pouring to develop it, etc. You know, there's a, a reasonably uncontroversial and well developed set of techniques that you can use there to give you the data to support your argument. I think it's fair to say that where nature based solutions are concerned or natural capital markets are, are concerned. Um, those data markets are still much younger and less developed. And that's what a lot of brilliant scientists now are starting to do, including um, those who, who work with Jeremy in, in Highland Rewilding. So, you know, for, for, for in a state like Tavianic, that I know that they're going to be doing some baselining uh, work over the next year or, to, year or two to understand what they currently have what the state of um, carbon sequestration is, what the state of biodiversity in this, uh, today is. Um, and then they'll be also you know, building the data architecture so that they can monitor changes over time. And you know, if you think about the planet's um, challenge of getting to net zero, nature's got an enormous role to play here. Um, and we're, we're gonna need everything to, to, to get there, but nature's clearly got an important role to play developing our understanding of how best to curate our natural environment and to preserve our natural environment so that it can accelerate the role that it's already playing for us there's a there's some massive wins there and they will of course that data is foundational to high integrity natural capital markets if you want yeah. to trade the stuff you need to be confident that um that what you're trading is based on good observable accurate scientifically proven data and um, and that's one of the one of the many things that Highlands Rewilding will be doing. So it's just exciting to be there at the start of that. Um, you've got to be, you know, everybody involved in natural capital markets has to be patient. Um, but you've got to be patient with a sense of urgency at the same time, which yes. is why we were keen to do this. And a, and a number of people have said, well, you know, you shouldn't be providing you know, it's a small ticket relative to an infrastructure bank. It's a bridging loan. You don't normally do bridging loans. And it was a problem that we could solve um, with the tools available to us and a problem that was worth solving. Because mm -hmm. if you look at what the Highland Rewilding team are, uh, are going to do with, with that estate and the others that they've already been working on, um, I think we'll look back in 10, 20 years time and note that that was, you know, one of the foundation stones for what I hope is going to be some really vibrant natural capital markets and biodiversity um, markets. I'm not sure I want to say that, but you know what I mean. Um, I know exactly. What you in mean. the development of both of those um, aspects of, uh, of the natural capital world um, over the next couple of decades. Well, I, th I think it's I mean, it's so exciting, you know, to talk to Lord Deben yesterday, this will come out on the next shortly, you know, there was a frustration about, you know, delay, distract, deflect, not enough work being done. What you're doing here is actually experimenting and being almost like a sort of fintech, but a patient capital, very institutional government. I mean, it's a lovely blend uh, from what I'm hearing. I, I imagine your staff get very excited about working with you on these projects. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, one of the really interesting aspects of the, the leadership challenges you know, we're deploying public money. I have 
HM Treasury is my shareholder. Um, and so th there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, the way in which we conduct ourselves, the way we do our value for money assessments. Um, but we're also required, you know, if we're going to fulfill the potential of the organization, we need to become quite entrepreneurial. We need to do things that other people look at and, you know, wonder, why, why are you doing this? Uh, and that's a really interesting leadership challenge. Mm. And it's one that actually, as you say, the staff are really enjoying um, because we, you know, we do have the privilege of saying we've kind of got, in the context of the UK, the ultimate shareholder. We've also got the privilege of doing new things, doing things that other people might like to do, but for, for policy reasons, for regulatory reasons, for risk reasons, for risk appetite reasons, might not yet be ready to do. They'll get yeah. there. Um, yeah. And I hope that if by us going first in some of these areas, we can encourage others to come along with us. Uh, and when we met many years ago, when you were group CEO of uh, HSBC, I was, it was around the time, the beginning of open banking. And a lot of what we're trying to do is to sort of stimulate that fintech economy around climate techs. Um, you know, again, startups, accelerators, you know, early projects, learn from it. Because today, you know, we've got big challenger banks that are, that now exist. Uh, yep. They've also informed the incumbents to change their practices. Can you see, um, just for our audience, do you think that there might be that kind of accelerative pattern emerging in this area because of people like you creating the stimulus? Oh, without question. I mean, you know, we're, we're going to be a, a hopefully an important but reasonably small part of the system. But entrepreneurs, um, uh, social entrepreneurs, scientists, you know, anyone who's got a passion or an insight into this could make a difference. And as you say, as we learned with the fintech space, you know, you, you don't have to become a unicorn or to disrupt the entire industry to be successful. You can you can solve a small piece of a big problem and create enormous value um, yeah. as others buy your technology or rent your technology or, or your solution. So that, you know, right now, this is the world's biggest problem, I would say, beyond geopolitics, this is the world's biggest problem without a doubt. The more people have a go, take some risk, try and solve some problems, try and convene capital into some of the, these problems that need to get solved, the better off we'll be. And one of the things I like to, I really enjoy saying to people is we have no competitors, right? Um, it's nice to run a bank with no competitors because, uh, if somebody else wants to do something and they've got the capital to do it, you say we we wish them well. But it does mean, you know, the, the positive side of that, the negative statement is we need to become really good at collaborating with other people. Um, and our constraint is that our size, the number of people that we've got to go to, you know, to go into to go in to collaborate. But that's something that we intend to do really well. And and as we recruit staff, that's one of the reasons they want to be here. Well, that's fantastic. And honestly, I'm hair standing on the back of my neck. Exciting to think what you might achieve with this. And uh, let's hope the people listening uh, can feel they can contribute to that. Uh, John, thank you so much for your time coming on today, inspiring us for the weekend ahead uh, and, and the years ahead. Thank you indeed. My pleasure. Thanks very much for having me.